Hi, and welcome to the Spain online event. My name is Julia Armfield, and we are here to celebrate the UK publication of Greta and Valden by Rebecca K. Riley. Rebecca is a New Zealand author, and Greta and Valden was first published by Victoria University Press in 2021, having received the 2019 Adam Foundation Prize in Creative Writing. At the 2022 Ockham New Zealand Book Awards, it was shortlisted for the Jan Medlicott Acorn Prize for Fiction and received the Hubert Church Prize for the Best First Book of Fiction. The poet Hera Lindsay Bird said, Greta and Valden is one of the few genuinely funny books I've ever read. Totally delightful, psychologically astute and dry as an astronaut space cracker. It's like if Ella Batman wrote Franny and Zoe, but gay. I want the whole thing as a lower back tattoo, which to be honest, if I ever received that review, I'd probably just like give up and stop because I don't know how you top that ever. Um, so I thought, uh, Rebecca, before we sort of get into questions, you were going to read a little section, which I think is one mm -hmm. of my favorite sections from the novel. So do you want to do you want to dive us in? Mm -hmm. OK, so this chapter is called um, Peach and it's on page 118 if you want to read along. Um, <laughs> OK, I sit with my hand straight up in the air until a waiter gives me the nod across the crowded restaurant and I feel the hot anticipation of what's about to happen. What do you think of Wilson, Fereshtia asks, refolding the menu. Who the fuck is Wilson? Rashmika isn't looking at her. She's looking behind her at a large hanging picture of a cowboy. The guy I brought to the party. Why don't you ever pay attention to my life? Greta, did you remember we want extra Taiwan sausage? I nod, trying to keep the order in my head until the waiter comes over with his notepad flicking his hair. Yep, he says. Could we get... Eight chicken breasts, eight pork belly, eight beef brisket, eight potato, ten Taiwan sausage, two eggplant, four tofu, two sing tao, one Coke Zero, and one peach ice too. I smash juice. How spicy? Medium, I say, folding the menu triumphantly. What about the lamb? Thresh asks. Elliot shakes his head. The lamb isn't cost effective. The waiter nods and goes to ring up our total. Are you sure that guy's name was Wilson? Rashmika asks. I thought it was Winston. Of course his name wasn't Winston. I should know. I'm the one going out with him. Was he named after the volleyball in Castaway? I think he was born before that. I don't know when that came out. It came out in 2001, I say. My dad took me. He was supposed to take me to 102 Dalmatians, but he thought it looked uninspired. I hope Wilson wasn't born after 2001, Elliot says. I think it would be cool if you were going out with someone who was born after 2001 and named after a volleyball, Rashmika says. You do you, babes. Fereshtia groans. I'm not doing that. I don't even think I like him anyway. I can show a photo of you at the end of my English 1 to 1 tutorial, see if you get any takers. Rashmika, shut up. Change the subject. Rashmika laughs as the drinks arrive at the table and she cracks open her sing towel. What did you think of Castaway then, Gree? Mm, I don't really remember. We saw it at like 10 in the morning. It wasn't long before I started school and I used to have Wednesdays out with my dad when he wasn't working. Before I started school, I hung out with this old woman who owned a liquor store, Rashmika says. She called me Naughty Rashi and we would go to Pack and Save and buy like 40 bags of chips to sell at the liquor store. Where was your mum? Fereshtia asks, opening her can of Coke Zero carefully. She's just had her nails done. She was working at Decca. She worked in the lingerie department at Decca when we first came to New Zealand because her accounting degree wasn't recognised here. Then it shut down and she worked at the counter at Renders. Then it shut down. So she worked at the post office and studied to get her accounting certificate at night, which is lucky because that post office shut down. Did your parents ever work at Decca, Elliot? He rolls his eyes. No, they didn't. They met working at KPMG because their accounting degrees were recognised by the white privileged state. As you know, yeah, Rashmika says. I just wanted to make you say it. Your mum's so proud of you, Elliot says. She showed me and Greta your degree certificate the other night, you know. Rashmika freezes. No, she didn't. Yeah, she did, I say, mixing my peach ice mash juice with my straw. She showed us your degree certificate and then told us not to buy you any rupee car books for your birthday because you do not like her. And then she gave us two glasses of water each which we drank in silence while you recorded your provocative raps in the background. Fereshtia laughs so much she nearly chokes on her Coke Zero. Oh, shut the fuck up, Rashmika says to her. Your parents are always trying to give us a whole plate of raisins every time we come over. They must spend hours emptying those little red boxes on a plate to impress us. 
raisins. When have my parents ever given you a whole plate of raisins? And if they did, why wouldn't they just buy them in a bag? Horeshe laughs and laughs. Maybe things would have turned out better with Wilson if my parents had shown him my degree certificate. What's that got to do with anything? Says Rashmika. I don't want to fuck Greta. Horeshe shrugs. We all know that I was not the only person there that day in Rashmika's mum's kitchen, having her achievements shown off to me. Elliot drinks his singtao. Rashmika frowns. Greta's taken now anyway. I set her up with that toilet woman and now they're in love. Oh, I say, focusing on my straw, wishing I hadn't been thrown under the bus because the other topic was too sensitive. I don't know if I would say that. That girl with the Shrek voice. Freshia reaches over and grabs my wrist with her pointy maroon nails. Did you see her again? Her eyes are wide like big plates of raisins. Yes, yeah, sort of. I turn around and look at the chefs turning the skewers on the charcoal grill that stretches across the back wall. Do you think we ordered enough Taiwan sausage? We ordered 10 skewers. It's enough. What happened with the girl? We had an agreeable meeting. Don't be like that, Greta. Horeshia's nails are digging deeper into my wrist. Rashmika puts her bottle down heavily on the table. Just say if you had sex or not, and so we can all concentrate properly when the food gets here and burn our mouths the way the creator intended. I wrinkle my nose. We didn't the first time. She came to my house after our date, and we made out a lot, but that was it. Ah, oh, Faresh Tess says, relinquishing her grip on me. And then what happened the second time, Elliot asks. Well, then we did, like we were. And then my brother came home from his work trip a night early and was shouting in Russian. And I hadn't closed the door because he wasn't supposed to be there. So I yelled at him to get out. But she thought I was yelling at her to get out of me. So she yanked her hand out and V ran out the door with his bag still on. And then it turns out he went and sat in the squires until 1am and had a ghetto. Everyone looks at me in astonished silence while the waiter unloads the 46 skewers onto the rectangular plate in the middle of our table. Are you going to see her again? Rashta asks. Oh yeah, I'm going to see her again. Rashmika groans. Now everyone's going to remember this story and not my good one about how I was part of an illegal chip selling syndicate. I smile and start loading skewers onto my own plate. Sort out your own sex capades then, naughty Rashi. End of chapter. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's brilliant. I think I should have muted myself because you're just going to have loads of audio of me like snortling in the background there. I love that chapter. Snortling? So, yeah, that's just the noise that I was making. I think that's fine. I think I love so much. I wanted you to read that bit so much because I think it's just like, it's so indicative of something that makes this novel really special, which is that it's so like conversational, but it sounds like people you know, but it's so specific at the same time. And mm -hmm. so like, so bizarre in its tone and yet so recognizable in its tone and I just I love it I love it so much it's so great I think it's like it's very easy to in essence sort of like sitcomize this novel when you're talking about mm -hmm. it and be like well it's about like a queer brother and sister navigating personal highs and lows and life and love in the big city with like a Maori Russian Catalan family and it's always interesting to me the way that a novel can sort of become of a piece with its trappings but I want to do it justice when I talk about it because it's all mm -hmm. of these things extraordinarily funny but it's also incredibly strange and specific and it's wrapped up in politics and family history and it's like it's very much a novel with a capital n do you find people responding to it in ways that you hadn't expected and do you feel like people have particular expectations of it going in yeah I definitely do um I was just going to say first that the order in that chapter is a real order that I made at that restaurant <laughs> oh, from my notes app um, it's called Gogo -Go Music Cafe and it really does have it like used to be a like rodeo themed barbecue restaurant in the 80s and then it's some Chinese barbecue place bought it and they didn't change any of the decor in there so it still has these sort of like big portraits of cowboys and um, oh like bullhorns and stuff on the walls, but it's a Chinese barbecue cafe. Um, but no, I definitely know what you mean. And I think that that is a really strange part of first like writing the novel and then like putting it out into the world is that in the sort of like journey of publication, it just sort of completely changes what it is, I think, with yeah like how I think of it versus like how it's branded, what the blurb says. And I think, um, yeah, it's like the first time that you get your blurb, I was sort of like, oh, you know, this is fine. Maybe I would change some things, but like, I, this is such a bizarre thing that's sort of like in your 
reality at that time. It's an email. You're like, what am I going to do with this email? Okay, I'll say that it's fine. And then like years and years later, you're like, why did I let them sort of use these particular phrases? Because now I'm like stuck with people being like, these two things that compares it to like don't go together and I that makes me very confused about what this book is going to be and then I think like well I'm I'm not like involved with either of these two media products in my life I don't fully understand the sort of like implications of them and so yeah I do think that people tend to go into the book thinking that it's going to be like a pretty commercially standard rom-com which is like absolutely not how I felt writing it. Mm. I think there was, especially before it was edited, that there was so many sort of like rambling bits and there's like that whole, like three pages that's one sentence and things that I don't think that you would see like in commercial fiction. Yeah, of course. Um, But yeah, so it's like met, I think it like initially like met with that, sort of audience looking for like something like light and fun first Mm. which is not something that I would have expected because I'm like oh it's a gay book people hate gay people it's about ethnic minorities like nobody wants to read about that and then I think especially a lot of those aspects were sort of glossed over in the New Zealand publication and so it was like sort of like oh it's just like a happy fun light read Mm. once you're already in there oh it's it's a bit gay but like that's all right because it's sort of like a standard (laughs) it's like a standard (laughs) like plot structure and stuff so we can like deal with that whereas I would have definitely thought that the reverse was like more important to me Mm, yeah absolutely I think it's it's interesting as well isn't it because so much of publication is a sort of it's an act of sleuthing your way into people's attention Mm -hmm. because the, the book is presented as certain things and therefore you manage to sort of like get your way under the wire with people. But this book is like often like emotionally devastating. And this book is often very upsetting and it's very, very, um, so what I'm looking for. And it's very, it's just very complex. And it's very sort of, there is a lot of family saga building on family saga and it's about identity and things. And I think that it's it's so rewarding in a way to come into a novel expecting one thing and then to get so many other things like for the price of one, basically. Mm. I think it's very interesting. There's, so obviously the book has come out in New Zealand already and now it's coming out in the UK and the US. Have you found mm. the publication process to be like markedly different or similar? Do you feel like people are reacting to different aspects of the book? Um, I haven't seen so much of the reaction to the book um, aside it from, from like it being on the list on, and sort of people saying that it's like pretty good or... <laughs> read it quickly or whatever but I haven't seen anyone sort of have like a deeper take on it yet I think outside of New Zealand but um the whole publication process is just entirely different it was sort of like for me in New Zealand it was like I finished the manuscript and then all of our I wrote it as part of my master's and then all of our manuscripts got assessed by the publisher who was connected with the university right and so then because I won the prize for like the best manuscript in the year and then the publisher spoke to me at the prize event and was like okay we'll like set up a meeting with you in the new year because obviously the end of the university year ends in December um and yeah and then they published it (laughs) that's it that was that was what happened and um like the margins here are like very 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 tight so you're not seeing any sort of pre-publication like the book gets edited somebody proofreads it it gets printed and then they put it in the shops and then hopefully you're going to get a review um I got a couple of reviews but nearly everything sort of like popped off for the book six months later um and then I got nominated for the Jan Mitlacott, which is like the National Book Prize. So that was like a whole lot of media in that. But doing it this way and like being with like a big five and stuff, I'm like, what is all this stuff that I have to do? <laughs> no, like, uh, obviously, it makes sense. 
<laughs> it makes sense to advertise a book before it comes out, but it's not something that I have personally ever experienced before, uh -huh. which has yeah, exactly. like, obvious um, positives and negatives. Positive because people are interested in the book, but also negative because I think in New Zealand you don't you aren't affected by a budget or where your publisher sees your book sort of like in the peaking order of their list or whatever. There there is none of that. All the books sort of come out equal, and then word of mouth sort of dictates what becomes popular. Like that's it. No, completely. I think the process is so different. We were talking, <laughs> we were talking before we started recording about like existing as a writer and sort of on this sort of scale means that people are going to be like now we, we need you to do some TikToks and we need you to do like some advertising and we need you to like exist as a writer in a very different way and I find that so interesting as just like a part of the process both as a positive as, and as a negative but I think it makes you, mm -hmm. you have to sort of consider your identity within it in a completely different way um so the book itself so I want to talk about voice in this book a bit because you move back and forth between Greta and Valden, who are both very much their own people, but they also contain shades of each other in tone and in the way they're reacting to each other. So how did you go about perfecting these voices? And did you find that one or the other was markedly easier to write? Yeah, like 100% Valden was way easier. Really? I thought it was so easy. I think um, that... I don't remember now because it's like 2018, but I think that I would have preferred at the time to just have written his perspective, but I thought that was sort of a bad idea um, in terms of like a published product to have this sort of like man. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, it will be more appealing like on my master's application if I say that I'm going to write these two different gender perspectives. And then I just found it so hard to write Greta. I'd never really written any female characters before. Mm. Yeah, I just thought it was really hard. And so I think a lot of her scenes I had to, I think a lot of Valen's scenes have been in there since the beginning, but a lot of Greta's scenes I had to like write them and write them again because the voice was bad. Mm. That's so it just like didn't, didn't make sense and like inconsistent. Yeah. It's, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, it would be awful if I was like, yeah, I can really tell actually that you found Greta really hard, but like, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> no, I would never have expected that at all. I think the thing that is so lovely about it is that I think the balance really allows you, the balance really allows you, not a breather, that's the wrong word, but it, it reads more as conversation because you have, you're sort of mm. coming back and forth between these two similar energies but they're very they're pitched very differently like one I think is always up here when one is certainly more down here and so it gives the novel this kind of this very beautiful rhythm that feels quite natural and it feels like sort of one is always leading into the other um so it's a novel it's a novel about identity and also about assumptions to some degree I think like people are uh, say throughout the book assuming that Greta is bisexual because she looks a certain way or people um, referring to Valden as like the Maori one and making assumptions on the basis of that did the first person allow you to sort of play with that in a particular way? Like what people thought of the characters versus what they thought of themselves? Oh, yeah, I love that sort of stuff so much, especially like when you have the two characters who are seeing each other all the time. I just like mm -hmm. the relish in that opportunity to at points just sort of insert sort of like very factual information that the previous narrator was totally wrong about something that like yeah, they're like sort of like oh my god I don't know how I could ever like break it to my family this like horrible truth that I found out and the other person is like talking to someone else in the family about that thing that they've always <laughs> all known about <laughs> as if it's That's like so totally true. casual it's it's real joy to like be able to do that I think I've been trying to write in third person and um it's not as fun it's harder as well it's hard have, and I like I so. worry that my voice comes through too much or like my judgments on the characters or things like that I did write something in workshop in third person and our course coordinator was like this just sounds like you sort of casting aspersions on everything that happens it's just my screed of judgment my 300 page screed <laughs> yeah. I know it's I think he did this away. stupid thing sorry <laughs> No, no, I always think that like first person oddly allows you to be more um a little bit more filmic in a way because mm -hmm. it's sort of like you say when you're having one person being like, Oh my god, how will I ever tell people this? And then it's like the camera swings to somebody else having a different conversation and it always makes like you eating feel... a Kit Kat or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
exactly. It's also kind of to do with that. It's it's a novel where people are sort of constantly labeling and relabeling themselves. There's a thing I always think about from it, which is it's not necessarily in terms of sexuality or race, but rather like there's a bit when Greta is like I'm a beautiful husk filled with opinions about globalism and a strong desire to go out for dinner. And I think like it really captures something very true about the things that we feel ourselves to be when we're caught in a moment. We say like, I'm this now. And it's sort of like a way of dealing. Did you, did that feel true to you? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, like, I think the most resonant piece like that for me is at the end when Al says, something about like you're a beautiful woman and I'm whatever I am <laughs> like at that point you just like I I don't know and that's sort of fine yeah whereas that sort of hasn't been really discussed throughout the book except Valden being like why is Elle's hair getting shorter every time I see her <laughs> is she having a crisis <laughs> like... no no it's so like, obviously we talk about like the many different things that I think that this novel is. It's so romantic too. Like it's about, it's about wanting to be seen and adored by someone and sort of dealing with the messy relationships one gets into whilst trying to figure out who you are. Um, and also to some degree, like grappling with the queer phobic nature of like romantic institutions and marriage and things like that. Like, do, do you perceive it as a kissing book? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> it, do you think do you think that it is do you think it's primarily romantic? Do you think it is primarily something else? Like how do you how do you see the romance mm. sitting alongside everything else in it? I don't think I don't think it's a primarily romantic book. I think mm -hmm. especially I think in Greta's storyline that she's like, oh my god, I like have to find someone to love me for like sort of half the book and then she enters into a relationship and then sort of stops talking about that she's never like you know like sort of like gushing about how much she loves being in this new relationship or anything she just turns her entire focus onto being like I hate my mom I hate my brother everyone's sort yeah. of against me <laughs> that sort of is just over with that yeah. problem and she moves on to something else right I think I think that Valden's storyline is sort of like mostly or maybe like even half romantic and then the rest is all just him sort of accepting himself mm. or I sort of I don't know I think he sort of accepts himself immediately before the events of the novel yeah. and he so his whole thing is now that I've accepted who I am what am I going to do next mm. yeah because he's you know he keeps sort of throwing all this information in that like he was lying on his parents basement floor like addicted to real housewives what seems like one year ago and that's sort of over with now yeah yeah well it's interesting actually I was talking to my wife about it right before we did this and we we're sort of like it's not so much a novel about becoming as it is a novel about realizing because I think quite a lot of what particularly with Valden what is what he has become and like what he is has already been quite set in stone like at the beginning of the novel mm -hmm. as you say it's about how you then like put that into practice essentially I think so I think yeah. it's a really it's a really interesting arc in that way um something I love about this novel is how much it sits in its own specifics it isn't trying to be overarchingly relatable um and in that way it actually achieves a far greater sense of the universal than I think it otherwise would like I always think of the specifics of the Rumbo story, for instance. Like, it's so highly weird and specific, but at the same time, like, everyone's dad has an equally deranged story in that way. Mm -hmm. I think there's something I, I don't know, were you particularly aware of doing this, of just being like, I'm not going to try and, like, reach out to anybody else's experience. I'm just going to make this about, like, really specific things that, like, when you talk about the restaurant, for instance, that's a place that you recognize, and it feels... It's unbelievably like strange and specific, but also like I think everybody can therefore go, oh yeah, that is a real place that I've probably experienced too. Like, were you aware of doing that when you were writing it? Um, I think I feel like when I wrote it, I had a freedom that I no longer have, mm -hmm. and that I didn't think that it would be published. So I was sort of in the position of being like, I need to write this word document the best that I can and then I won't be humiliated at the end of the year when everybody else like gets a better grade than me like I need to sort of like keep up with everyone else and yeah, everyone else has written 70 events. pages so I need to write 70 pages too and <laughs> so I knew I you know 
I was thinking about the, I guess I was thinking about the things that people in my workshop didn't like about the text or things like that. But mm. I wasn't really thinking like, oh, the, the people overseas aren't, aren't going to recognize this. Or it may, I mean, like even like people, I sure, I'm sure that you have the same experience being from London, but all the other people in New Zealand like truly hate Aucklanders so much. Like, <laughs> Yes, you are so, right, right? Like, just even writing a book that's set in Auckland is like an act of rebellion. <laughs> and I think that some of the like when I was a new author and I would see what people had written about the book online, a lot of people in New Zealand were like, I didn't want to read this book because it's about Jaffers, which is just another fucking Aucklander. But when I like started reading it, I realized that it was actually pretty funny so I continued but I would still like I never want to go there it's a stupid place like everyone's rich and they're all drinking lattes and stuff which I think is like referred to near the end of the book as well when um V is like in this tv program and then they look at the facebook comments on the like episode of the show and it's all these people just saying I hate Aucklanders <laughs> But that is, you know, that's the reality. So I was thinking, like, even, yeah, even that was, like, an act of rebellion for me, just writing about yeah. what, what my own life was like, not at the time because I was studying in Wellington. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. It's writing is a political act there just by writing about Auckland completely. It's interesting, that because I was going to ask you this at the end, but, like, do you feel now that you are presumably writing or looking to write something else, do you feel that you are writing for a wider audience rather than just writing for yourself oh yeah and it, it kind of sucks <laughs> it, does I mean, a bit, it, doesn't, doesn't it? it doesn't feel like it's a waste of time when you're doing it you're like okay well somebody is going to look at this at least one person is going to read this yeah. um rather than someone who's like being paid to as your exam supervisor or whoever but also you're like oh I can't just sort of write whatever because people are going to be like the quality of this second novel is very low <laughs> compared to the first one. I think the only sort of like increased sense of freedom that I have is that I'm not relying on applying for a government grant to. Yeah, that does help. So it doesn't need to be in New Zealand or it doesn't need to like represent culture or something which I mean I didn't have to the first time either because they were not giving me any money <laughs> um but yeah like that's the freedom and then the imprisonment is the people of the world mm. yes yeah that, I think we'll just have that on the front of the next book the imprisonment of the people of the world is something and we'll go from there so you're juggling like you're juggling about like 18 characters in this novel and it sort of made me mm. wonder like what you read because it's sort of it's not necessarily that it's uncommon to do that, but it made me think of like, it made me think of the arc of like Victorian novels in a way, in the way that you're sort of remembering what everybody's name is and that kind of thing and dropping in on lots of different people's arcs and storylines. So is is it something that you are particularly, like what, what do you read? I mean, at the time I was not reading anything. I was <laughs> not up to date with contemporary literature. I had, had no idea what was going on. I didn't have any friends who were like really into reading or anything. Um, so what was I doing? I don't know. Oh, um, I guess <laughs> that is kind of like another sort of freedom that I wasn't sort of reading the novels that were coming out at that time by people like sort of in a similar market or demographic to me and then being like, oh, I should do something like this or I shouldn't do something like this. Everyone's doing it. I just had no idea. Um, I think that makes such a difference though sometimes because I think that yeah. obviously it's very important that we all read contemporary literature but I think that the curse of reading only contemporary literature can really get mm -hmm. you stuck in a box um, and therefore I think some of the most interesting novels that I've read like contemporary novels I've read are from people who are like yeah I only watch movies or people who are like yeah. yeah I only read manga or something like it's always it's so interesting when people are drawing from entirely different um, inspirations. Yeah really. I'm a big um, movie guy and okay. I've also seen pretty much every sitcom just like from beginning to end whether I was enjoying it or not I especially like when I was at uni I would just like start with the first episode on like project free tv and then just go through to the end like Seinfeld or Sex in the City or Parks and Rec or New Girl or whatever I just yep, sort of blasted through all of them and then 
I read Nine Stories by Salinger and was like, oh, you're allowed to sort of write about random characters and like never fulfill, you know, what happens to them in, in the end or whatever. Oh, mm. I always like think of this like in the end thing and it's from Little Britain. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Maybe we like, cut that. People are like, wow, an incredible contemporary reference right there. <laughs> it's one of my main like literary um, philosophies. It's one of those things that I didn't realize where I got it from, but it's a sketch in Little Britain where it's the, it's the fat fighters and someone from East Enders joins the group and the, the, the little group leader, obviously played by Matt Lucas, keeps asking like what happens to the characters in the end. And this actor is like getting more and more frustrated. And in the end, he says, there is no end. It just sort of keeps going. And that's <laughs> how I write. There's, and I, I think like every time. You have all these comp titles, right? People are like, it's Fleabag and it's Shit's Creek and it's this or that. It's like, no, it's just Little Britain. Let's really get the little audience Britain. with that. That's great. Uh, it's Little Britain. It's... um. A, like 80 year old book that I read when I was 22 and like that's it mm -hmm. I love that though I think that's why it is its own thing so much because I think that it can be it's very difficult to be operating within a prism whereby if you are only if you have a very mm -hmm. limited frame of reference I don't think you realize what you're allowed to do sometimes it's like you were kind of no. saying this thing I think mm -hmm. permission is so important in writing when you realize that actually there are so many things that you can do when there aren't really any rules um, and I just, I think yeah. that's what's important to realize. I mean, that for me, like, like doing the writing, like creative writing masters, like that was the permission to be writing a novel where like, I like personally felt I had no business writing a novel because I'd like never really written sort of like a complete thing before. I just used to write these sort of non sequitur sort of like scenes of different people and just like never connected them up and never finished them and never yeah. used proper punctuation or anything so yeah that was a, that was a permission in a sense as well mm. but yeah if you don't if you're not exposed to anything then you don't really like have these concerns about what am I doing um I think when I applied I sent someone I sent my friend my application and she was like oh this is so funny you must love Sally Rooney and I was like I've never heard of this person in my life um so it was a different time it was 2018 um and I was in Greece so I went into like every like English language bookstore that I saw in Athens and none of them had her books so I was like I think this person is like a real nobody and then I <laughs> I um I flew, quote off a quote from you today I flew into Luton and didn't have enough money to stay in London so I went directly to Cardiff on the bus and then I like got out, I went into the town, like the middle of the city and they had this water stones. And then I went in there and then normal people was like the book of the year. And they had this whole yeah. table that was like piled high. And I was like, okay, so in the Anglosphere, this is an important woman. Yeah. <laughs> but then I read the book and I was like, this, why did you tell me it was really funny? It's so sad. So sad, really sad. It's really it's so awful. Sad. I don't know it's fascinating though because I think that people people really do make assumptions about um about you when you're a writer and they always make assumptions on the basis of books particularly like you must mm -hmm. love this person, you must love that person and usually when people do this to me they're like oh you must love like this novel and that novel I'm like I love The Abyss by James Cameron like I love to watch uh like 1990s horror movies that's what mm -hmm. I like to do and yeah, I always just feel like I really have to like remind people that I can actually read. It's just that I'm choosing to do other things most of the time. And yeah, I, I mean, know. sometimes I read. Yeah, sometimes I am capable of doing that thing, but I just, I'd rather watch the entire of James Cameron. That's, that's what I actually want to do. It does but make a I difference. I think that, um, I think that most of the people who are concerned with talking about writing are readers rather than writers. So I think whenever they're sort of like asking you questions, they're like, and also, can you sort of recommend 10 contemporary novels that are in line with yours that we can sell in our shop or we can like use our newspaper to sell or whatever? And you're like, oh my God, I don't know any. And you're like, well, my friend read this one and she hated it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I had that problem quite a lot though because people will ask me this thing and usually what I'll do, and because they're usually like UK publications and I'll be like, 
at the time I was like Greta and Valden, which I read when it was like only out in New Zealand and mm-hmm. like uh, novels of Jennifer Down, which are out in like Australia. I'm just like, well, this is useless to you, but this is, this is the, these are the recommendations I'm giving you. So good luck. Um, yeah. I, I mean, wanted... two of my favorite, sorry, <laughs> two of my favorite her. books are Mrs. Caliban and, which is like referenced in the book and um, Bear. I can't recommend them to people who like my book. They like really enjoyed this. It like made me feel warm for the winter and stuff. What do you like reading? And I'm like, well, I like reading books about people having sex with creatures. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think you just got to do it, man. I think you used to be like broaden your horizons. Why not have sex with a bear? I think that's fine. I mean, uh, in my in my publicity life, I have been returned my answers more than once to amend <laughs> to something more in line with what the other people have said or things like that so I am like a little bit wary of saying what I actually think saying your truth no, I get you I'm not, I'm not allowed to speak my truth no I have constantly I'm just like well I've read uh, I've read five different books about mountaineering disasters in the past mm-hmm. year Is that any help and they're like no we, we don't need to we don't need to read into thin air that's not that's not helpful so yeah um I am aware of time but I wanted to ask you a couple of other questions before we ended mm-hmm. which is that I think without giving too much away in this novel there is a lot um like under the surface about sort of the complicated emotional lives of adults of parents that operates almost as sort of like a mystery subplot underpinning the rest of the text. Like, how do you go about, again, I don't want to give too much away because I know this is a mm-hmm. this is a view mainly for people who won't have read it yet, but like, how did you go about sort of threading this through the rest of the narrative, the things that we essentially discover at the end? I think in order to do that, I was imagining like all of the rest of the stuff I think it's like I okay to me it feels like what we see in this novel is maybe like one half of Mm. what has happened to this family in this year and that's sort of been like cracked away from the other half so you can see like bits of it but I definitely the other half of it entirely like exists to me and then I'm like how much of that can I am I going to like use for Mm. another so it's like you basically doesn't exist you own and know the whole universe and you're just giving us like a very small section of that yeah because you can't like write too much because then no one's going to publish it (laughs) (laughs) you gotta write like a two hundred thousand word manuscript and be like yeah I'm like a and I'm an unknown (laughs) and And here is my war and peace Oh, this is war and peace and I've written all the perspectives of these like bisexual people in their 50s <laughs> and I know that's what everyone wants so, like at the time like a woman in her 20s to be okay I have now. to say though speaking of all of the perspectives I'm a Casper girly like my favorite character <laughs> upset can't help it and like the moment I don't think this is a spoiler so it's fine but if you think it okay. is that we can take it in post but the moment when we suddenly get like Casper POV I was like climbing the ceiling screaming I was so excited it's just it's really pathetic I love him so much like that yeah, was talk, something that... about Casper for a second because I love him that was something that I thought was going to be like not allowed it's like to sort of like have like random other perspectives like into the book and you know, it's just one of those things you're like okay eventually somebody is going to put something in the side of a pdf saying we need to get rid of this and then it just <laughs> never happened you're like how am I sort of like evading this you know I'm getting called out for all sorts of other things that people want removed like jokes they're like this isn't funny reference nobody's gonna get this no one knows what Jetstar is <laughs> whatever but that, I was like, how, like, the very, very long sentence and the random POVs at the end, I was like, how am I, how am I sneaking this through? But I feel like <laughs> a lot of being a novelist is sneaking stuff through. Oh, it is. And also, like, we were talking about getting permission for things earlier. Mm-hmm. And literally, like, you writing this book gave me permission to do something in my next book because I was not going to do random POV in my next novel. And then I was like, actually, I am Why going not? to. Because... Rebecca Why told me not? and I think that's yeah I mean I felt right reading I felt the same about um I just read the end of our wives this week and I was like oh it ends 
But we don't <laughs> need to know what happened to everybody oh. in the rest of their lives. It just went exactly. on. Okay, so yeah. I don't need to have a big scene at the end of my next book where everyone sees how they feel. I think that like most of the negative reaction on the initial publication of this book was people saying that the end was wasn't tied up enough for them. <laughs> so I'm not honest, I'm I'm that, I, I have a I just, man, honestly, it's it's so refreshing to be like, the point of a novel is the story that I am choosing to tell you, and that is the mm. beginning and the end. That's what the book is. You're not writing like an oral history of this entire family. You yeah, are it's like in, um, running us in for a minute and then taking us out, and I love that so much. Like um, how German fairy tales end with, like, is translated in English, and if they haven't died, then they'll still be alive today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly, Which and you just like, oh, good. <laughs> oh, exactly. So, you reference like what you write next. What are you writing next? Ah, uh, like I like written ten pages since I finished writing this like five years ago. Which is like, how has this happened? I think like every time I'm like, okay, now I get to focus on this new book, and they're like, we're gonna sell the book to the UK, and then that's sort of like okay we're gonna do that's that's it that's what we're gonna do and they're like oh actually at the agency they think that you might have a shot in the states and <laughs> that's too many people <laughs> I think there's like it's your like, attention as well it takes all of your attention because you uh you have to be with this book you can't just be like it's whatever it's my it's sort of a primary school age child to me that I have and now I'm now sort of leaving nine till three every day at the gate. You've got to like oh, be exactly. with it still. <laughs> so it is that. Even it's hard. I don't hate it, so that's all right. Yeah, you don't want to hate your but, nine-year-old child, but yeah, still. I am, I am sort of, I am trying to write this book about um, Betty and Jeb. Hmm. And whatever they've been up to, I mean, like, not just during the period of this novel, but, like, in the past and, like, before and after the events of this novel, I think. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, oh, my God, am I trying to reinvent the wheel by, like, writing things in different periods and, like, writing writing a page that takes place in the, like, mid-80s takes so long because I'm just, like, looking up every single thing. I'm like, did they have polystyrene boxes? Would people have heard of this band? Wow. could you like you couldn't really like call people who lived in other cities without it costing like a lot of money and all this sort of stuff which is just taking way longer than when I write something set in like 2008 and I'm like I know every detail of this world <laughs> it's so hard that honestly especially when you're not even writing like deep period you're just writing like yeah the 80s, no. or the 80s. you're just like just well like I don't anything. know I wasn't there. I assume everything was the same, but it definitely wasn't because it was actually like 40, 50 years ago, which is a disgusting thought. Yeah, sort of yeah. like 1996 is when I started primary school. And before that, the world is mystery. Yeah, nothing <laughs> happened began before that. With the Atlanta Olympics is how the <laughs> world began. The Spice Girls were the first band. <laughs> there were no bands before that. And we were fine. <laughs> oh, man. Cool. Well, I want to I want to end on a level of minor despair mm. about the concept of, of new writing. So we'll end there. But um, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, and thank you so much to everybody who watched. Um, and thank you. Yes. Thank you for watching this Fane online event.